So much emphasis is put on the ocean, on the distances between us. But the real river, the real energy, the real currents, I believe, is in the blood. And it's the blood that spills when you take ink. It's the blood that links us together. Moko is about transformation. And I think Pea and Tatao and Kakao, all those traditions state the same thing and serve the same purpose. And what is really exciting is that it happens on the living human body. And I think there's nothing more erotically raucous than a bunch of inked polis, Māori, Samoan, Tahitian, Hawaiian, jumping around together, showing each other their ink. You know, it, it really is an incredible celebration of who we are through our ink. We are putting our marks back onto our bodies so that we can be in touch with our ancestral past, so that we can remember. I always tell kids it's, it's who we are, it's who we want to be, and it's essentially our libraries. This is our Google. And for me personally, because there's so many stories embedded in the marks, they consistently keep me in contact with our histories. It's not something that I can just put away in the cupboard. Not like maybe a dance costume, where you do your dance and then you put it in the cupboard and maybe stays there for another year. When you're tataoed, it's present. You are present with your ancestors every day. And it's a great reminder. In the Cook Islands, we call it maru. So that is reclaiming that art form. Because we didn't have any records of a maru in the Cook Islands, um, but we know that we were heavily tattooed and that woman wore on the legs, it just made sense that we had a very similar design sense to the malu of Samoa. But the patterns is what defines it and makes it different. So you'll notice on my maru that I've used patterns like the pupu inano, like the maru itiki, and the mokora, and the papabaro, and the manutai especially, this one that I really um, connect with, that reflect who I am and my connection to the Cook Islands. I think my maru speaks quite a different language, and it's reconnecting to my ancestors. So in, in more of a way than, say, um, getting a tattoo on my arm or, you know, anything like that. What my maru does is I'm trying to reclaim what's been lost. Well, we've seen a lot of revival happen in other parts of the Pacific Islands, definitely starting from the Polynesian Islands and moving across the Pacific and the Philippines was kind of one of those last places to have that momentum to really share with the world the revival and sharing culture and to do sharing tattoo work. In the Philippines, uh, in the past, women were the tattooers and now we are continuing that tradition. A lot of our people have chosen not to remember and so this is why the tatak is so important is that we need to reawaken the revival and have a voice. It's one of the loudest ways that we can solidify our identity. A lot of the patterns are similar, you know, we have, uh, I know some of the vegetation is specific to islands, but there's a lot of things that came over, you know, just like how the, you know, Polynesians came from somewhere before, you know, and so it's really neat to see almost like an evolution throughout uh, time. Through the marks, you can see where the different voyages, so there's a definite connection to Southeast Asia, just through the designs, you can see it. What you see on repeat are frigate birds, centipedes, they're everywhere, but then also the diamond. You can see that, and it doesn't start with us, it goes further. The diamond, for me, it's become a woman's symbol and how women are the foundation of life.
So the mal, the diamond mal shape, to me, is sort of the be all and end all of the female tatau. It's where all life starts. It's the fale. It's all aspects of a woman. It's connected to childbirth, fertility, femininity, um, our place in society, our place within our culture. So it's everything in that one little pattern. So that is why I think people do sort of react and get conscious of how it's used. When I first sat down with, with, with Paolo, I'll start with Paolo because I used to go, well, you know, oh, what's the malu? And, he, and the first thing he said to me is the four sides of the house. He looked at me, he goes, well, what's the first house you live in? And I was like, oh, of course. It's the house of the people, it's the whare tangata. If you read the malu, the messages of the malu, uh, it's about our story of creation. The growing of the seed is protected by custom, by usage, by, hu by history, but most importantly by theology. And the malu means, you know, how do you protect, you know, the making of the human being. Ipufakairo is a carved gourd, but it's also a metaphor for the Mons Veneris, like for the private parts of a woman. And in both of these metaphors, um, contained within the context of these incredibly erotic, raunchy, fabulous ancient chants, are all these references to genital tattooing, like to the marking of the gate through which a new human will come into the world. Cambridge, I found a diapot called an okongara, who made of stone. This particular vessel was used only in the tattooing ceremonies of women on their private parts by other women. So in the Fijian practice of traditional tattooing, uh, it was women who marked and women who wore the marks. When it was practiced in Fiji, it was about the movement from girlhood to womanhood, a sort of triangular marking on the mons pubis, on the, the vulva. Uh, it goes around the waist and it's on the buttocks. I don't know why it was so important to mark that area. I mean, it's the center of the universe. has brought the importance of my body back to the forefront. Fijian women's tattoo was discontinued with the advent of Christianity. When Fijian women put on the mu'u mu, everything from neck down became invisible. And so our bodies are not written into history. And that's a tragedy. What wearing these marks means is it's unshackling ourselves from the burdens of colonial hang-ups. I've had to confront my own relationship with my body. I've had to confront how other people might see it, how other people might see the sharing of it. Accepting who I am, and that's a powerful thing of being marked. The female has always been present in the story of Tatao from the twins through to the Fijian woman's Venkia, through to the Papua New Guinea woman, through to our Filipino cousins, the, and, and in Tahiti, and with Māori. There's always been women present in this art form, and especially within the mythologies. So I think when the men came and they wrote about men's things for men's, they didn't acknowledge that all were shown that these beautiful markings were, were specifically for us too, so that'll teach them. <laughs> I think that that journey of women bringing the akoao to us, the journey is a long thing. Ah, you know, ole, ole malanga, ole malanga te tōrua. So the journey needs to be continued. Uh, there is no end to this journey. And each of us and each generation have a responsibility to help that journey 
live on uh, and not just in our memories but now on our bodies, on our skin. So what Dei Ma and Tila Whainga brought then will continue into my great-grandchildren's generation that speaks to them about who they are as women and what their roles and responsibilities are because a malanga needs to be hosted. Uh, we need to be able to host those stories. We need to be able to care for those stories. We need to be able to keep that legend and keep that story going. Uh. I cannot understand why, as a young person, you would choose to wear tattoos that are barbed wire or a flower when you could be wearing your grandmother's marks all the way back to who knows when, when you could be wearing, in our equivalents, diamonds. This is the gift that we've been given. These are our marks of mana, and we have to keep it alive. <laughs> Oh, let's go, I'm